Hello, this is the sixth video in a series of videos on the meaning of the houses. We're looking at super 12th house people. These are the people that have the most planets in the 12th house. We have done the research and explained it in the first five videos on the people who have the most planets in the 12th house, combining equal houses, vertex houses, and midheaven houses. Now we're going to focus on each one of those house systems individually, starting with equal house system. So in other words, let's see the charts of people who have the most planets in the 12th house using equal houses. And we're giving a little more emphasis to the sun and moon. They get five points. Mercury, Venus, Mars get three points. Jupiter and Saturn, two points. Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, one point. So using that scheme, who has the most planets in the 12th house, it is San Hector Valdiv Valdivielso. So he is the number one person. He gets 21 points. We're going to look at his chart in a moment. And we have several other people that are listed here. It's not bold, meaning we do not have a lot of biographical information. When we do researches, research on houses, this is also true with signs, we need a lot of personal information about the person because the houses tell us an attitude towards life, a perspective on life. And sometimes you don't pick that up just from a description of what vocation the person has or a few other basic things. So the people that we have a good amount of uh, biography for are San Hector Val de Vielso, Eddie Campbell, Elaine Deloche, who we already covered earlier because he ended up being very strong 12th house, taking into account all three house systems, Felix Guattari, and Charles Coequin. Hope I'm saying that right. So, and these others have very little biography. Let's see who they are. These are the super 12th house people. We are doing this extreme case sampling research where there's no selection bias. We have no choice over who the people are. And these super people must exhibit the qualities. This really gives us a way to test our ideas. And what do we find out? The number one person. Well, let's, um, let's pull up his chart. There it is. This is his chart with Placidus houses. And look at that 12th house. Now, if we change it to equal houses, we're going to get the same thing. Let me just do it. If I go to settings, house system, equal, same thing. Moon, Mars, Jupiter, Mercury, Venus, and Sun in the 12th house. His time is rounded off to the hour, 5 a.m., born in 1910. But the Sun is, what is that, six degrees from the ascendant. The moon is five degrees within the fifth house. They're very clearly in the 12th house. So even if the time is off, well, I'll show you. Let's go to time adjust. Let's adjust it, say, 10 minutes earlier. We go 10 minutes earlier. The sun is still three degrees within the 12th house. And if we go 10 minutes later, the... Moon is two degrees within the twelfth uh, house, so you know even going ten, fifteen minutes there, there everything's still there. So we're fairly confident that he does have all of these planets in the twelfth house, both lights as we like to call them, sun and moon, all three inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, and Jupiter in the twelfth house. Huge stellium happens to be opposition Saturn. Look at that um, big opposition there. So, 12th house, we're saying is a sense of responsibility to a natural design, like a divine plan, or a design of nature, like a kind of blueprint for life. Depending on the person's philosophy, it could be a blueprint based on nature, the way nature designed things, or a blueprint from God, and that we must adhere to this blueprint. Is he like that? Wow, is he <laughs> fantastically like that? 
So according to traditional ideas on 12th house as being spiritual, uh, like renunciates, things like this, which is a possibility given our interpretation of 12th house. So there's not a tremendous difference between the usual interpretation of 12th house and what we're suggesting. So given both ideas, wow, he fits exactly right. There's a picture of him. He's a uh, Catholic priest. Um, so he was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina. He moved to Spain when he was three or four years old. In other words, his parents moved to Spain and brought the family there. He attended a Catholic religious teaching congregation called De La Salle Brothers in 1922. So when he was 11 years old, he became ordained around 15 to 16 years old. And he took the name Benito de Jesus. And when 23 to 24 years old, he started teaching in the village of Turan in the Asturias region in northwest Spain. He had a huge class of 90 students and had a reputation for working extremely hard. And there he is, devoting his life to the clergy, to teaching. He starts at a very young age. He's brought up in this life. He accepts it. He embraces it. Um, he works very hard. He's extremely dedicated to it. Now, here's one of the reasons why he became famous. You know, that alone might not get you a, a major biographies in Wikipedia, etc. So here's a story. In June 1931, a new constitution was adopted in Spain. And here's a quote about this new constitution. So there's a political change in Spain where he's living in 1931. The new constitution established freedom of speech and freedom of association, extended suffrage to women in 1933, allowed divorce, and stripped the Spanish nobility of any special legal status. Wow. Huge democratization of Spain in 1931. Finally, women are ready to vote. Well, that happens in 1933. Divorce is allowed. Nobility stripped of their special legal status. So this is very progressive, modern, from our viewpoint, very positive development. Scholars have described the Constitution as hostile to religion. So that's interesting. Instead of being, you know, freedom of religion, it's, it's just you know, directly hostile to religion, with one scholar characterizing it as one of the most hostile of the 20th century. Uh, so Valdivielso and other clergy began wearing regular clothes and addressed each other as sir instead of brother. So there's this attack on religion. And of course, they're, you know, hiding it a bit. They put on regular clothes instead of what he's wearing here, calling each other sir instead of brother. So it's, it's dangerous to be um, in the Catholic Church as a priest at this time. Now, here's another quote, um, and I've got the website down here um, where I get this from. It, this is translated from Spanish, the original website is in Spanish, so it might be a little bit awkward in the translation, but it, it gets across the idea. Hector, along with seven brothers and the father who accompanied them, were arrested by the communists and taken to the Casa del Pueblo. On October 9th at dawn, they were taken to the Turan Cemetery. After forcing them to dig a mass grave, they were made to stand against the wall of the cemetery. Aware of the end, their last words were, Long live Christ the King. Okay, so they're going to be murdered. Um, aware of the end, their last words, oh, I just read that, <laughs> Long live Christ the King. Hector and his companions had died without prior trial. He was not yet 24 years old. So he, they're called the Martyrs of Asturias. They were be, beatified on April 29th, 1990 by Pope, Paul, by Pope John Paul II for odium fidei, that is, for hatred of the faith. They had been martyred. The Holy Father explained, uh, as the Holy Father explained, they were, in addition to Valdivielso, okay, this the names of the other people, Wow, <laughs> what a 12th house story. Not only is he a priest, he's a martyr. Um, and the reason he gets beatified, something marvelous has to happen. And again, from that same website, quote, the miracle, uh, but to be elevated to the category of saints 
A miracle has to be proven, and this took place the same day of the beatification. Rafaela Bravo Hiron, a 24-year-old Nicaraguan woman, was dying of uterine cancer. Her husband, a former student of La Salle, prayed to two, no prayed two novenas, asking for the intercession of the martyrs. The next day, the woman was completely cured. The doctors who had evicted her hours before found no explanations in science for what has had happened. So there was a miraculous healing of this lady uh, who was um, praying to, for the intercession of these martyrs. So they consider that to be a miracle. What a 12th house story. Total dedication to the divine plan that he perceives that Hector Valdivielso sees as what's right, as the way God created the universe. And this is how it is. This is the law, and man's law cannot interfere, and he is a martyr. He's murdered for his belief, and he will not renounce it. That's about as an extreme a 12th house story as you will ever hear. Uh, and one of the things that's interesting is that focusing on the meaning of the 12th house in the way that we are explaining it as a, you could say, a dedication, a strong belief and dedication to some sense of what the right way is, how life is designed. And the chart does not show us what people conclude. You know, if we look at everything, maybe we, I'm sure we get some hints, but just the 12th house by itself isn't going to tell us what conclusion the person comes to about what this divine plan or plan of nature is. But whatever they decide, it becomes something that they devote themselves to. And typically, there are three possibilities I've noticed. One is religious or spiritual, as is the case with San Hector Valdivielso. Uh, the other is biological and, and, and based on nature, that this is the way nature created us and the nature of being a human being. And the other one that sometimes overlaps, all of these can overlap, is uh, political. Like, what is the best social system? What is the social system? How were we made? Were we made as human beings to be in a capitalist society or a socialist society? These are the kinds of things that people focus on. It's usually something about socialism, communism, or capitalism and democracy, that spectrum of thought. Or it's about the law of God, you know, Christ is king, we devote ourselves to that, or some other law of God, or a law of nature. This is how, this is, you know, just like you need certain soil for plants to grow, you need a certain environment for humans being healthy. That's how life is created. So, all right. So the most extreme 12th house person using e equal house system is killed because he won't renounce his faith in Jesus and in the Catholic Church. Church. This is an extraordinary confirmation that the 12th house gives a person a sense of responsibility to fulfill what the person perceives is their part in natural law. That's another way of putting it, natural law. The proper design and purpose of things and how we need to fit into it. Often there is a sense that the larger laws of life are more important than our individual preferences. Oh, that's an important part of the 12th house. This sense of something bigger than us as individuals, the law of life, how things work, and that we need to fit into that larger context. That seems to be the consistent theme. We as individuals need to fit into the larger design or plan or pattern of things. Now, let's look at this formula for the strength of the ascendant and the vertex. So here's Valdivielso's chart, born in Buenos Aires, at 34 south 36, about 35 degrees is relatively, you know, um, relatively close to the equator. It's way less than 45 north or 45 south. So if we go to listings and go to planets or asteroids positions list, and we go to planet positions list, and we scroll down, this is the revised way that I've, I've done this starting in around mid-November. We'll put the updates up uh, by December 1st, where it shows the ascendant is 76%, vertex only 24 
the old formula gave it only 68%. So with the new formula, the power of the ascendant is 76%. So the idea is that as you're closer to the equator, the ascendant gets stronger and stronger. And at about 35 north or 35 south latitude, which is the latitude of Buenos Aires, the ascendant is extremely strong, 76%. This means that when we look at the chart wheel for San Hector Valdivielso, this is the chart. This is it. Um, the vertex chart, which has 19 Libra on the ascendant, puts his moon. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, I didn't notice that before. That's fascinating. Um, if we go to settings, house system, and select vertex, see that vertex at 19 Aries becomes the seventh house. Look at his moon at 18 Libra. His moon is within about one degree of the ascendant. Um, also, his Neptune square the moon is right at the midheaven using vertex houses. Oh, this is fascinating. Excuse me, he's uh, scraping something off here. I don't know if you heard that. Um, this is fascinating using vertex houses. Oh, he has three. <laughs> well, um, the Uranus Neptune opposition is two degrees within the 10th and the 4th house using uh, vertex houses, and the moon is one degree above the ascendant. Wow. So this confirms another idea that we found from other charts confirmed here as well, which is this. Very simple. If you have a planet conjunct an angular cusp, there are six angular cusps. Um, well, actually, you can think of it like this. There are 12 angular cusps. 12, because you have the ascendant, 4th, 7th, and 10th cusps using all three house systems, equal, vertex, and midheaven. Using vertex houses, he has moon conjunct the ascendant, and the Uranus-Neptune opposition right on the midheaven fourth house cusp. And our theory of vertex houses is that they're related to you and your colleagues, you and your associates, you and the people around you who work with you in your goals, in your aspirations. So they're colleagues, they're people who help us. They can be practical helpers, like people that fix things, that fix your car. They can be merchants, the grocer, the, you know, the person who sells shoes or clothes. All of these people we interact with, not because we just want to hang out with them. That's what the Ascendant is about. The Ascendant and Descendant is about the people right in your environment who are just ha happen to be there your friends, your family, your neighbors. It's the people around you. And do you want to be around these people? Do you want to be with them? And do you want to form relationships with them just because of them? So somebody gets married, theoretically, you know, in most cases, let's hope, or the, the concept is that it's a seventh house relationship. You don't marry somebody because they're good for your job or good for your progress in life. You know, people may do that sometimes. That would be a, a vertex. That's what vertex is about. Forming associations because you can achieve things together. Colleagues, partnerships for business. So that it's more pragmatic, practical, and related to where you're headed in life. Ascendant, descendant is just people there for the purpose of being there. Now, the fact that he has moon rising. Now, this gets interesting too. In vibrational astrology, the moon is not just feelings, moods, being temperamental or something like that. The moon is literally the past. It's the past. And it can be a collective past. It can be an individual past. And in relationship to house cusps, 
what I've been noticing, this is not like a solid part of vibrational astrology yet, is the moon is usually the collective past. What we have in common, like our biology, our ancestry, um, our heritage. And he is part of the Catholic Church, that this ancient system of the soul, of, of, of our heritage and where we came from. So he's got the moon rising in the vertex houses, meaning that he is in, how can I say, he, he's interested in the relationship to ancestors, to our heritage, to where we came from, from the people who made our lives possible and who bring us spiritual illumination, Uranus Neptune. So his colleagues, his, his friends in the church, um, this is his life. So bottom line is, when, this is the point I want to make, when a planet is angular in any house system, it brings that house system out. So even though vertex houses are weak, only 24% for somebody born in Buenos Aires, it's given a little more emphasis in his chart because it's highlighted with angular planets. And what that means is not so much that he's dominated by vertex reality, but that he's connected to it and has something to contribute with it. He's got something to do, to be active, to participate, to engage is a good word. So if you have an angular planet in any house system, you want to engage with that reality. So he engages with the associations that make for the spiritual life with the church, Moon, Uranus, Neptune. Interesting. But the vertex houses in general are still not extremely strong for him. They're secondary. The main thing is that he is devoted in the equal houses. All these planets are in the 12th house. He's devoted to the law of God and he becomes a noted person, a martyr in the Catholic Church. That's his relationship to his colleagues, to his tradition, to his work. He becomes a highlighted person, first house. So you see how both houses work into it. But notice the primary thing for him. What's primary? He's 12th house. The fact he becomes a martyr, it, you know, that happens after he's dead. I mean, you know, it's the way he dies that makes him a singular person. It's not the fundamental primary thing going on. But you do get a, he is an important and respected person. I'm sure he was uh, and, and had, a, you might say, a little bit of a leadership role um, in, you know, he influenced people by his dedication to the first house emphasis. So that's it, my friends. First person, bottom line, first person in this research, 12th house, he's a Christian martyr. Oh, my God. You know, I don't need to say any more than that. This fits so extremely well. Now, let's see who the second person is in this research. Well, we have this uh, Yvonne McLashen and Theophile Guy Gibbert. We don't have really any biography about them. So the next person is Eddie Campbell. Uh, we do have biographical information for him. His birth time is 720. Nice. It's not on the half hour or on the hour, half hour, or even the quarter hour. He's born in 1955. He's contemporary. He's alive today as I'm doing this research. Um, there are some short videos of him, which I love videos. You get to actually see the person, uh, very helpful for our research. I watched some of the videos. So he is excellent for our research. People that are alive, contemporary, their birth time is not rounded off um, in an obvious way. Uh, he's got everything we want for our research. And who is he? And by the way, here's his website, eddiecampbelldammit.com. So you already can tell from... Uh, his website name, he's, uh, you know, not, not a conservative uh, wallflower kind of person. A little bit funny or, or willing to stand out. EddieCampbellDammit.com So he's a cartoonist. One of his very successful cartoons is a graphic novel, From Hell. So 
he didn't write it. It's written by a fellow, Alan Moore. Eddie Campbell, the cartoonist, illustrates it. So this, they call it a graphic novel. It's not quite a cartoon. It's more like a novel that's illustrated with images that have a cartoonish kind of quality to them. Um, so it is essentially in a cartoon-like format. So the illustrations are as fundamental as the words. Right, the illustrations are just as important as the words. They're a big part of it. Uh, the original of From Hell was published in 1999, and it was in black and white. 20 years later, a color version was released. We have a link um, to a video. So you can go to this video, YouTube. Uh, you can see it there. Y-O-U-T-U.B-E slash etc. J-U-J-P-G-R-I-U-T-G-K or just go to um, YouTube and search for Eddie Campbell from hell or something. And you'll find it if you want to study this more carefully. Um, so this uh, book from hell is a story about Jack the Ripper, this guy who was a rapist. And there are several theories about who he was and what his motivations were were. So it's a mysterious, kind of a, you might say, creepy story, like this guy Jack the Ripper, very mysterious, and nobody knows exactly who he was, and especially there's a lot of speculation about what his motivations were, that he might have been connected with royalty, like he was hired out by them, or maybe not. Um, so my impression of Eddie Campbell from watching the videos and you know, reading about him and going to his website, you know, I spent some time with it. He loves stories and he loves seeing how people live and what they experience. He just loves the story. Like here's this guy, Jack the River, and he loves the artistic process of rendering life. He loves making these cartoons the way, you know, somebody might love sports or love music or the way we love anything. He loves it. It's just fascinating to him. Oh, there's this guy, Jack the Ripper. What happened? It's just pure fascination. It doesn't seem to have any, like, large implication like, like the Twelfth House often does. Like, no, it's like some great divine plan and dedicate, dedicating yourself to the divine plan. He doesn't seem to have any of that. He's a guy who loves illustrating. He's highly intelligent, sensitive, but he's not going to, like, from his viewpoint, like, waste his energy on a bunch of weird speculations and idealizations. Uh, he's just involved in life. It's interesting. It's engaging. And this is what he does. If you watch the videos, I thought he looks young for his age. He's fit for his age. He looks good. He has a kind of artistic flair and a no-nonsense manner. He's an artist. He's really, you know, and... And no fluff, you know, this is what he does. He digs right into it. Uh, and all the detail, you know, getting these pictures just right. He talks about the years that he spent making the color version. So he's a dedicated artist. He just loves getting it right and looking at it. And, you know, how does it look now, this color version and making little adjustments? Uh, same way people would do theater or anything else. Just totally engaged, trying to get it right. Now, my conclusion, let's look at his chart. He contradicts everything we just learned about the 12th house. Um, let's, where is he? Eddie Campbell. There he is. This is with placid houses, with equal houses. It's going to be the same. I'm not even going to flip it. Instead of uh, six Leo, you have two Leo. In either case, the cusp falls between Uranus and Venus. So he's got Venus, Jupiter, Sun, Mars, Mercury, and Pluto in the 12th house. Clearly, they're in the 12th house. Um, and he, didn't, he he's the first person in the research who's not obviously fitting. The others are very straightforward. So how can this be? Uh, perhaps the birth time is wrong. Could have been recorded incorrectly. So Perhaps there's something about Eddie Campbell that is strong but is not evident. It's really hidden because he's very open and straightforward. I, you know, went to his website, looked, watched his videos. So here's what I think. He was born in Glasgow. 
A Glasgow has a latitude of 55 north 53. And remember that Europe is much further north than, for example, North America. Uh, Winnipeg has a latitude, Winnipeg, Canada, less than 50 north. Montreal, Canada is only 45 north. Um, you know, it's deceiving because Europe has this um, winds that come up from, they come from Africa up the Atlantic Ocean and it helps warm it. So it's extremely far north is my point. Canada's northernmost city is Edmonton, which is further south than Glasgow. Sirius gives his strength with the new formula as 77% vertex. Let's look at it. Here's Eddie Campbell, birth chart. We go to listing. We go to planets or asteroid, planet positions list. Scroll down. Vertex, 77%. With the old formula, it was 69. The new formula, it's even stronger. Ascendant, 23%. He's mostly vertex at that latitude. So, this, how, oh, let's go back to his chart. Sorry, I'm jumping around here. This is not the primary um, chart. And look where his vertex is, down at 2 Virgo. Um, so let's go to settings, house system, and select vertex on seventh cusp. Now everything's in the first house. Only his Uranus is left in the 12th house, not too far from the ascendant, about three degrees. And now all of this, Venus, Jupiter, Sun, Mars, Mercury, Pluto is in the first house in Leo. He's a cartoonist. <laughs> He, he's uh, colorful. He, he's he got a little bit of flamboyant. The Venus-Jupiter conjunction in Leo in the beginning of the first house. The color, the vibrancy. Um, this makes sense. And the first house, we'll see if it's confirmed when we get to the formal research part of it, but our sense of the first house in vibrational astrology is like an innocent sense of being like here i am woo here we are <laughs> isn't this interesting which is exactly the way he is he's like a child going you know a childlike sense of innocence i mean he's very deep and profound but he doesn't he, he how, how can i say he's more like an existentialist more of an observer more as a, a critic and observer of life without adding a bunch of things on top of it, a bunch of philosophical speculations. It's it's a vibrant exposing, and that's what he does. He exposes Jack the Ripper and the possibilities of it. And and the Leo is, is very obvious, how individuals choose their lives and make themselves and the fascination with their stories. It just fits beautifully. And one of the things in vibrational astrology is that our way of thinking is that if you have to stretch the meanings so far beyond what we're thinking of, up until now, our 12th house people were people like Elaine, how do you say his name, Delos, if I can remember right, the, the, the French guy who starts all of these facilities for, uh, you know, medical facilities all around the world in, in places where they don't have good medical care. I mean, one 12th house story after another, after another, after another. And then you hit Eddie Campbell and he doesn't fit. And he's the first one at an extreme latitude. He's the first one that has uh, the vertex way stronger than the ascendant. And the vertex houses are working much more obviously, clearly and directly and not needing a lot of fancy footwork and, you know, rationalizing things. Whoa. This is this is very very interesting, and appearing that this vertex is really really powerful, uh, at, when you get up to latitudes like Glasgow, and again it shows that let's go back to our slide, um, seventy seven percent, ascendant's only twenty three percent. That means the ascendant to, um, houses are still there. There is still a little bit of twelfth house flavor. It's not completely gone, which could be his intrigue with you know, why things could be the way they are, you know, it becomes a secondary theme. The main theme is he's a cartoonist. Um, 
showing how life develops for people. Um, so our idea of this research is, can we go in, find the super people and have the charts fit the data? And we do it if we have this theory that uh, stick to our theory about the nature of the strength of the vertex and the ascendant. Okay, um, so here I just say some of the things I already said. Uh, he does have a 12th house equal house. It's weak. Maybe this has something to do with his interest in the awful tragic crimes of Jack the Ripper. How could they have happened? Uh, he is facing the things that bring pain and suffering to humanity, just as the health practitioners and religious leaders with 12th house emphasis do, but with the innocence and simplicity that the first house brings. Isn't that interesting? So he is addressing, he's, his most famous work is about tragedy. Um, you know, tremendous suffering. And you know, how could this be? But instead of directly healing it or taking an ethical and moral position about it, as you would in medicine or in religion, He's really just exposing it and saying, here it is. What do we do about this? So there does seem to be, you know, a 12th house as a secondary quality that doesn't become the focus. Um, so the big conclusion, Eddie Campbell's chart makes sense only with the idea that the vertex is more powerful than the ascendant at this latitude. This is how we can get the astrology to fit the data that is not cherry picked to fit the observations about our super 12th house people. Well, frankly, this this research is blowing my mind a little bit because I'm not expecting this to be such a clear set of findings. The 12th house is getting confirmed very clearly and more dramatically, suggesting that maybe we can get hints about behavior from houses. One of the beliefs in vibrational astrology is you have to go to the aspects and midpoints to see behavior. But these attitudes of the 12th house are so strong when there's a stellium, certain behavioral outcomes are starting to look a little more probable and, you know, possible that we can, we can uh, sense what could happen. And, and secondly, the importance of vertex houses is the only way uh, the, the power of the vertex as you head to the ascendant, especially with this new formula. You know, I made another video um, just about this new formula. So, um, yeah. So, right. And we've talked about this. I don't know if I need to go over it again. But just to repeat, the vertex near the equator steer, stays near zero Aries and zero Libra, which doesn't make any sense. It means everybody's got the same vertex. So the vertex does not behave well near the equator. The ascendant does not behave well near the Arctic Circle and Antarctic Circle. And so this whole idea about the strength of the vertex and strength of the ascendant at different latitudes is fitting these charts. It makes sense theoretically. Things are all coming together. Okay. Um, so the four videos on houses. Yeah, if you go, if, you know, at Astrology DC, click on Houses, Interpretation and Calculation section of Astrology DC. And you'll see the other three videos. And here's what it looks like, you know, in, in, in the, uh, you know, in your um, videos area for subscribers. You're all subscribers because this is available for subscribers only. You click on this button here, Houses, Interpretation, Calculation. You'll see these three videos as well as the one we're making right now. If you want to um, study the... Uh, the formula and the observations that have driven our emphasis on the importance of the vertex at high latitudes and the power of the ascendant near the equator. So three videos about that. Okay, now the next person is going to be Felix Guattari, um, Elaine Deloche, we already discussed because he was in the previous list. He is an extremely strong equal house person, one of the strongest, and he came out one of the strongest overall. And as we, you know, discussed with him, 
he fits the idea of the 12,000 extraordinarily well as well. So in the next video, we are going long here at 40 minutes. Next video, we'll do Felix Guattari, a psychologist, and see how he fits the 12,000. It's an interesting uh, case also where the Vertex houses get involved. Fascinating. So we'll talk about him in the next video. Thank you very much for listening, my friends. God bless. Namaste.